Welcome. This is an introduction to QGIS and Digital Gazetteers. I'm Ryan Horn. I am a relatively new research consultant at the Office of Advanced Research and Computing. And you can find my contact information on this slide. And today we will be going over what are digital gazetteers, how do they work, what are these things. Even if you're familiar with what a GIS system is, a lot of people still are not that aware about digital gazetteers. I'll talk about linked open data and how does that relate to gazetteers and map making. I'll talk about how you're actually going to use all this stuff. If you want to make maps, you want to locate things, how do you use it? Uh, how do you reconcile the data that you're creating with what's already out there? Simply so you don't have to keep reinventing the wheel every time you do a mapping project. And then finally, making maps. How do we use QGIS? How do we use it? A lot of you are probably familiar with Esri products. You might be familiar with ArcMap. Maybe you've used Google Maps, and I want to learn something new, QGIS. So, we're going to start with a very basic question about maps. And this is something, before you even start talking about QGIS, as your gazetteers, first thing you want to say is, why do you want to make a map in the first place? And these are some questions asked. Well, what kind of information do you want to show? What kind of relationships do you want to show? So, why would you want to make a map? And again, feel free to talk on chat about this. I'm going to throw that open. Why make a map? Well, I mean, why? Why, why? why would you do any of this? Maybe your publisher requires one. And so maybe you want to orient your reader. Maybe you're talking about something like a historical phenomenon that, say, London in the 18th century, you just want to show where things are. I talked to a lot of researchers and consultants where, and consultations where they really don't want to make a map. When it gets done, they just want to talk about a relationship, but I don't really want to make a map for it. I'd rather do a network. But something to keep in mind is why why are you making a map? And what is what is it that you're trying to relate to the audience? A map is not scientific per se. A map is something that you are creating. It is your interpretation, it's your choices of colors, your choices of data. And so fundamentally, you're dealing with your decision to show show somebody something in a visual medium. And one of the things that you really deal with are places. You know, if you have a, just a map without anything on it, what, what are you showing then? You're just showing kind of a, like, terrain or something. And that's, sometimes you want to show that. But if you have names, if you have any kinds of associations, you're dealing with places. And I love places. Let's, let's think about what, what place data. Where do you get it from? Where, where do you, and again, I'm going to open this up for um, people on at home, throw it in the chat, those of you in the room. Where do you get place data from? What's that? Coordinates. All right, there's coordinates, but where do you get those from? Maybe you're walking around with, uh, I mean, we all have this thing now, right? Maybe you're walking around taking geolocated pictures of things. That's one place to, to get place data from. What other places would you get? Yeah, what other places would you get data about places from? Yes. Uh, the Getty Thesaurus and Geographic Names. Okay, so the Getty Source Geographic Names has a lot of place names in it. Um, a census, satellite information, Google Maps. Yeah, there's lots of places where there's lots of data sources about places. And what do we mean when we're talking about a place? Like, we have different definitions, we have different conceptions of what a place is, we have different names. Um, one of the great examples being, say, New York. You know, New York. New York, the city, the Big Apple, uh, the town, that you can probably name a dozen names for New York. They all refer to the same thing. But do they mean the same, does it have the same resonance for people? Some of, some of you love New York, some of you hate New York, some of you are like me and love and hate it at the same time. There's different kinds of things tied in with what New York is. Also think about what is the definition of it? Like when we're talking about the city, the five boroughs, Manhattan Island, and let's just do that exercise for the city we're in right now. Let's look at our wonderful pictures of LA. We have the Wikipedia picture. Doesn't that look fantastic? Look at that. That's beautiful. We never see LA like that. Well, we got this from Thanksgiving. What is that? That's 405. That's probably how most of us spent a lot of time in LA, sitting on one side or the other of the 405 stuck in traffic. So let's, let's do this exercise for a second. Let's start with the institution right here. Where do you put the dot for UCLA? If you're going to make UCLA a place on a map, 
Where do you put that place? What, where do you put the coordinates? Where are you saying this is where UCLA is? Would you put it on the uh, football stadium? Probably not. They're not that good. Where would you put? Where would you put the dock? Bruin Bear. Okay, that's a good one. That's a symbolic heart of the campus, right? But would you put it on the bursar's office where all the money comes in? Well, where are some other examples? Well, where would you put it on? Would you maybe draw a polygon and put it in the middle of the polygon? Uh, when I was at UCSB, I actually went found out where Google Maps put the center of the university. It turned out to be next to a manhole cover and a and this little like field area behind a building. Not exactly what you want to be putting on your postcard as the image of the university, right? Probably something similar here. If we put the middle of the polygon, you might ride up in a road or, or something like that. Well, what about Los Angeles? Let's, let's expand this out. Where do you put the dot for LA? I mean, what if it is LA? Are we talking about the valley? Or are we talking about downtown LA? I mean, all of these are really different ideas, right? Like different locations, different kinds of conceptions. How do we model that? How do we put that into something that we can actually use as a map or something that we can use for spatial information? Well, this is the gazetteer approach. And so the gazetteer approach, but basically the gazetteer is familiar to those of us who are older and have things like the Rand McNally Atlas at the back of our cars. One definition of it is a, li it's a list of place names. These are often derived from maps or related to mapping somehow. Again, the Rand McNally Example, you know, you say, okay, I'm driving to whatever place it's on map three, grid E4, something like that. What's interesting about gazetteers is when you do this, every place name has a unique identifier. Think of it like a social security number for a place. It's identifying that this particular thing, this entity is its own thing, and it can be referred to by that number. So if we go back to our LA example, we could say that LA is number, I don't know, 2365 or something like that. But all of our conceptions about what LA is could be related to that through data. I could say, oh, I believe the dot should be at these coordinates. Well, I believe they should be at these other coordinates and so on, these polygons related to it. All of that is related to this gazetteer entry. And that is actually what is behind all this stuff. If you're using Google Maps, if you're finding out where things are, it's, there's an address book that's a gazetteers that are put on a base. So we're doing the same thing that Google does, isn't that cool? And what's also interesting about gazetteers is that you can have conceptual entities that you really can't locate physically. So if you're doing like a gazetteer of places that are meaningful to somebody, maybe it's a conceptual place. Maybe it's something that you really just can't map, but it's a place, it has value, you design something to it. Maybe it's something that's very squishy definitions, like where, how exactly do you map a mountain range? Where does the mountain stop or end? It doesn't really matter if you're doing, doing this, you can say, Oh, it's related to these things. That this is the ID for it. And so if you're at all interested in where something happens, if you're making a map to express people's senses of place or where events happen or anything, you're making some kind of gazetteer whether or not you realize it. So what's really the, then is the we, digital gazetteers have really expanded all of this even further. That instead of just saying, well, this is spatial information, we can put in things like, videos, we can put in audio, we can do, I mean, pick mapping. There's a lot of, there's basically an infinite amount of stuff that you can put in the gazetteer now that it's now that they're digital, and almost an infinite way of linking these all up. And I'm going to show you a few of them. Well, these ones I'm going to show you are based mostly on linked open data model. We'll get to what that is. I won't go too much into RDF and all the uh, weeds of the technology, because that's generally when people start leaving the meetings or falling asleep. But I'll give you a little overview of what that stuff is. And something to, to keep in mind, the gazetteers are not GIS. They're data. There's data data behind it. Oh, they contain spatial information. When we're dealing with gazetteers, we're dealing with a, basically a building block that we're going to then use GIS to, to do something with it. One gazetteer that's very important is GeoNames, which started as a project, I believe, of a lone madman and is now actually used by a lot of people, and I'll show you geonames.org. And what it is, it looks like the site was designed in 1997, but it's actually quite interesting. Let's type in Los Angeles, keeping our example going. And you'll see that there's lots of places that contain the name 
Los Angeles, and lots of things related to Los Angeles here. You can see, hey, Van Nuys, Burbank, Lakewood, Compton, all of them are neighborhoods within Los Angeles. Los Angeles itself, you'll see they have along this um, economic region of it, that's a place that has the URI. This is Los Angeles. This is their guest here entry for the city. You can see where that it has all this information about it, population, longitude, latitude. It has a stable identifier, which is here, 5368361. And you can see it's related to other things within the gas tiers in the country. It's within the county of Los Angeles and the state of California, and so on. Different kinds of feature information. And what's also neat about it is you can go and you can map it, and you can see how they put the dot on Los Angeles. So let's see where let's see where they've actually put it. It's somewhere near the uh, courthouse. Okay, that's good enough for the center of LA, right? The courthouse. And what's and GeoNames itself? It's it's um browsable. It's downloadable. It's open access. You can pull all 11 million place names into your own local database and use it for your own purposes. Another one, that's a world history gazetteer. This is something that that. It, Full disclosure, I've worked on a lot of these things. I'm kind of a gazetteer nerd at this point. But World History Gazetteer is uh, for the University of Pittsburgh. It just won another NEH grant. And its idea is to make a gazetteer of historical places, things that are really, that may not exist anymore or that have different names over time. And whgazetteer.org is the website for that. And I'll show you some of those, some of its functionality. Um, basically, you can see here that they've got featured data sets, so like they're making a data set of Dutch global history, so Dutch names and locations. They have um, the HGS, the US NDS, which is historical geography for Latin America. And here, again, we can explore and not search for, we'll keep our name going, Angeles. And you'll see there are, again, multiple Los Angeleses. This is the one that, that um, we're going to look in for it because, well, that's where it is. And you'll see it, it has information about the times and attestations that people are talking about the city. They've got links, they've got different URIs. And you'll see here, it actually links to geonames as well. So they're already building connections between de different data sets based on the, these gazetteers and these ID numbers. And there's even more specialized ones. Uh, this is one that I'm very involved with, uh, Pleiades which is pleadies.store.org. And this is something that looks at ancient places. So mostly in the Mediterranean basin, but it's trying to expand out. Um, obviously Los Angeles will not give us a result for this one. So let's search for something else. Let's say Athens. It would help if I can spell Athens correctly. And if we look at Athens, we can find out a lot of information about the city. We have again, a identifier. We have uh, longitude latitude. We have things that are related to Athens here. We have a lot of information about sources. And we have, you can see here, it's linked to other images. We'll get to how that works in a second. But the idea is that all behind all of these is this. They all have this identifier, whatever that identifier is. And if you use that on your own projects, you can actually get all of this information for free. So instead of you know going trying to find spatial information yourself or having to go with your GPS, you say, all right. Give me Athens, give me the location of it, then you can go on with what you're actually trying to do. So, well, so basically, so what? Well, as I just showed you, this contains a lot of information. There's a lot of stuff that's going to really help you when you build your own place when, you bring, when you're trying to use things again, like QJS. Um, there's no sense in basically geolocating stuff that someone else has already done. It's there, use the name. And these are really significant scholarly projects. The process of disambiguating places, of relating places to other places. It's actually a lot of work. It's a lot of effort. And as you're doing it, it really helps you organize and streamline your own research. So I would encourage anyone just to think about what are guests. Guest years are useful and they're real, they are academic products. And so how do you use these kind of things? So let's say that you start out with just a list of place names. You don't have any other information. You're doing research. This is really common in humanity situations where you'll be reading something and just get like a list of place names. Or you'll be going through a text and you'll say, okay, this person's describing all these things. I don't have any information about where they're located. I don't have any information about 
coordinates, I just have a place x. Well, how am I going to actually use gazetteers in that case? How do I start linking things up? And this is where you get to linked open beta and digital gazetteers. Um, well, if you're going to make it, one of the best practices I've found is to just list all your place names in a spreadsheet or a database. Uh, I like to say 99.9% .9 of all DH projects start out with a spreadsheet. This is this is uh, no different. So best practices, you say, I've got a place name. I know where I got it from, and I'm going to give it a unique ID. This can be completely arbitrary. You place one, two, three. Who cares? It's just identifying it as its own thing. And when you're building these kind of things, like guys, it's here, you want it to represent the same kind of data type. Places should be dots. If you're going to make things about polygons or larger things, that should be a different sheet. So you always want to keep the same kind of conceptual data types together. And again, other than that, it's up to you. You can have 400 rows of information, I mean, columns of information about a single place. That's okay. Just make sure you have an ID and the space where you can locate it later. I want to show you an example of that I helped somebody with, which is Rio in the 19th century. The idea was to study urbanism and trade and how things of architecture, uh, different kinds of neighborhoods, how did these influence trade? How, how was the uh, slave trade away from these or was it close to it? Like what are the kind of the neighborhoods? And then to actually start putting in maps and pictures and information about all of this. So it was a really thick mapping project. And how do you start with this kind of thing? Well, start with the sources. In this case, newspaper clippings, um, listings of, of businesses. We were actually quite lucky they had business names and then they had addresses. You almost never find this. This was great. Um, so I'm going to do a lot of people like, yeah, this is, this is wonderful. It'd be great to have this kind of thing. Well, maybe, and so what we did then was we built our gazetteer. And this is the very pretty typical thing. You have information about who owns, who owns it. You've got the actual address that we have. What, we had categorization types that we had different kinds of information. That's all the gazetteer is. It's just a listing. A quick question. Yes. Um, were you able to OCR these documents in order to get those things out, or are they yeah. what? How did how did you go about structure like creating well, structured data? Sure. I mean, first we tried OCR, but because of all we had so many different sources that it started to become a problem of parsing it. And so what we did was just say, okay, here's going to be a data model. We're going to have you know an ID. We're going to have who owns it, the address, this and this, and just pull up as you can. And so it was all hand. hand yeah, it was this one was hand. Wow. A lot of times OCR is useful, um, but sometimes it fails. So you just got to grab your pizza, put on your music, and spend several hours just, right. just transcribing things. So we did that. And then we used a Google API to find the addresses because what the cool thing about what we were looking at in Rio is that the streets are still there. So we could actually get a ballpark close to these addresses, find out what streets they were, and then map them. And so we use that with a geo-referenced image that we put on the streets and then there you go, we can actually locate these things and start building the neighborhoods of the points. And so this would not be possible if we didn't have the structured data about the places. We didn't actually make the gas tier first and we were you for you putting all these points. So that's one thing. Now we are gonna talk a little bit about linked open data, which is a different way of doing this. This is all pretty much done by hand is, and through this Google API, because no one else had any information about these, these locations or these points. That won't necessarily be the case for a lot. And so we're going to use link, linked open data to get this stuff. What is it? I am pretty much contractually obligated to put up the five star linked open data mug. Um, basically, this is going to be a very quick overview of what linked open data is. It's, it's data that's available on the web that you can link to, that's not proprietary, that it's open standards. It's basically, the, it's like geo names, these things I just showed you. Those are all five-star linked open data. You can grab it, you can pull things from it, you can use it. Um, it's based on things, and I just wanted you to be aware of what these things are. So if we mention them later, if you encounter them, a lot of it's based on RDF, which is kind of like XML. It is data about data being metadata. All of these IDs I told you, like each guy's tier entry has its own ID. We call it a URI, Uniform Resource Identifier. Um, basically, it's like a URL. It's just a location of where this stuff is. It's unique, like kind of like an email address. You can always use that same num that same number, the same ID, and you know what you're talking about. And so, again, what's really cool about this, and you mentioned the Getty before, is the Getty's also linked open data. 
And so once you start saying, I want to make these things, you get all the information that anyone has published that is related to that gazetteer entry. So if you're doing a project to say, I want to get all the texts that are available, if people have linked text to that URI, you grab them all. And you can do that in about two seconds with a simple computer code. So it's really, really pretty useful. An example of someone that does this in the uh, ancient world is Pelagios. And what this does is builds basically a linked open data system that was based on Cleve. So all these URIs that we invented for ancient places, people associated coins with them, museum finds with them, digs, texts, works. And so you can go in using uh, Pelagios, actually start pulling all this thick mapping information out, whatever you project you have to be doing that's related to, say, the ancient world. And other fields are starting to get there, but um, the ancient people have gotten there first somehow. Uh, it only took us like about 15 years to build all of this. But this is something that now more and more people, more and more fields are actually addressing. Environmental Humanities is using this a lot. I've seen this actually environmental studies. But we're starting to build these linked open data ecosystems. And they're starting to link together. So the discovery of data, publication of data is quite amazing. And so how do we use this? Well, again, sometimes we have data in the gazetteer form that has longitude latitude. That's easy to use, pull right into QGIS and map. Um, sometimes you have addresses, like I showed you with Rio. But sometimes you don't. Sometimes, again, you just have place names. And you need to reconcile this. You need to say that this place name means this kind of ID. Now, before, that used to be done by hand. That was really aggravating. Or by simple matching. Again, aggravating. How many different Springfields are there in the United States? Lots. How many different main streets are there? They start to get an idea of the magnitude of the problem. And so one thing that was created was this program called Recogito. And hopefully you've done your homework and have created an, an account there. If not, we'll, we'll go through it. And so what is Recogito? Again, created by Flavios. And this is, allowed, this is an annotation platform. You can put up an image. You can put up a text. You can put up a, a spreadsheet. And what it does is goes through several different guest tiers it gives you suggestions about what the, what those places are. So you can actually reconcile it and build linked open data. And you can download this in a number of formats. So I'm just give you an example of something I did. I did a coin board project. I'm still working on it. Um, this is one of your OCR nightmares again that a lot of this had to be done by hand. But everything that I've done with this, so this 4,000 plus boards, 25,000 entries are all linked to different resources. So you see here that this is the Cognito platform, but all linked to different communities resources. I have done means I can grab all of the geospatial information. I can grab all the coins that are associated with them. The, the amount of work to actually link all the stuff up and map it would have taken took years, you know, pounding the books, looking at it. Linked up with data, I was able to do this in about 10 minutes. An example, I can spit out this gazetteer now, which gives me all this different kinds of information I've done, all of it linked to your eyes which again allows me to map the thing. So this was an incredible time save. And we are gonna do one now. If you'll go to the, uh, the website, you'll see that there's something called in and out text. I hope everyone has eaten before this. If not, I'm sorry, I'm probably gonna make you hungry. This is a silly example, but I wanted to keep a California theme. Um, this thing does have addresses, so normally we just map that. But what we're going to do now is actually just try to see what Ricardito thinks about the place names. And so, again, hopefully this is after lunch. So if you want to go now, we're going to grab grab our data, and what we're going to do is upload it to Ricardito. We're going to look at the appropriate gas tiers. We're going to look at the results we have. We can look at the interface, and then we're going to export the results to bring it to QGIS later. So you kind of get an idea of how this pipeline works. So with that, let's go and start working on Ricagito. All right, so this is Ricagito. And I've decided here so I can, I can go back and forth. You can see where I'm going. We're going to log in. My username is very imaginative. There's my email. And you can see that I've got a bunch of stuff here. So we are going to upload something, in our case, the in and out text. So just sign up for Recog If you haven't done it, you can do it now. It'll take you maybe a minute or two to get an account and then jump on. And you'll see this kind of screen. And so how do we use this? Well, the big new button is a good way to start. 
and we're going to bring in our, we're going to upload a couple of folders. We're just going to do a file. And we're going to bring in in and out.txt. So this is my in and out.txt I just brought in. You'll see if I open it up, it is a text file that has all of these different place names that are all the in and out locations. So let's map these things. So that's fantastic. Let's go to our document settings. And you'll see that we have, you can add authors, you can add a license so that you can share it with other people. So that's pretty cool and pretty useful. Let's go to annotation preferences. Now this is important. If you're, up, if you're using Recogito, it's designed for several different gazetteers and you want to do an appropriate one. Uh, the in and out locations are probably not in a lot of spatial data for the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities. So why not? It's probably not Pleiades or China Historical Gazetteers. This stuff might actually be in geonames, but probably nothing else. So we do something like that. And then we go back to our main screen. We select our in and out. And we'd say, where are our options here? Name entity recognition. And again, we're going to say that we want to use an English language model. So you have different, you have, uh, different options there. And again, we want to make sure that we're only using geonames. And then we start the program. And you'll see that it's going to parse this. And it's going to actually look through our text and try to identify different place names that it finds. And again, you can do this for a text like I have here. I use it a lot with uh, gazetteer lists, actually. I'll just have a big list of place names that I'm trying to identify. And you'll see that, all right, it's already parsed. That's pretty cool, isn't it? So let's go, and now we'll open up our file again. Is everyone following along and sees the steps that's going on here? All right, so after we parse the thing, you'll see that it has these great things. Look at this, we click on Los Angeles, and it tells us that it's doing an automatic match and saying, hey, this is probably this GeoNames ID. And then you can do things like confirm it, say, yeah, that's true. That's what I want it to be. And you can say, um, the other uh, Los Angeles, you want to merge them? Yeah, we're all talking about the same Los Angeles. And you can do this for all this stuff, like Umbra. Well, it's probably not the one in Spain. So then you go change and you say, oh, wait, here's the one in the United States. So this is, we will say, all right, it's that one. And we say, okay, and next. And so you can do this for all the different entities that it recognizes. And what's neat about that is, let's look at a map view, and I'll show you what it's mapped. And you'll see there's dots everywhere, probably because we have to go and disambiguate those. But look how many that it's probably gotten right. So that's pretty cool. And you just go through and say, oh, Ventura Boulevard, if it doesn't have an exact match, that's okay. You can say, well, is there a Ventura Boulevard that your names does identify? If not, then you can say, fine, I'll edit this. I'll just keep it as a place, but I'll find its information from another source. And when you're all done with all this stuff, you can do, we can mess around for a couple minutes on here saying, hey, let's try to find out like if Conga Park is matched, if this is matched, and so on. Culver City, yeah, that's a good match, isn't it? Confirm. Okay, and then when you're all done, see so download options. And you can pull this as a CSV file, RDF, GeoNames, GeoJSON, KML, Markdown, all kinds of different ways of pulling down this data. Um, let's pull it in GeoJSON, which is a format we'll talk about in a minute. And so now this GeoJSON is ready to go when we're ready to map it. So. You can see a preview here. This is all the space, all the place information we have. And we'll pull that into our map in a second. So, Recognito and actually the World History Guys share a similar function. has really, really changed how you can interact with this linked open video. That instead of, again, spending hours and hours, days upon days of matching this stuff, it gives you potential matches with the gazetteer, the interface to select it, and a way to download it and pull it into mapping out. So this is really kind of a game changer for a lot of historical research, a lot of humanities mapping, actually mapping in general. So 
I'm going to pause there for a second. Um, everyone following along still and happily mapping or thinking about maps? Great, because now we are going to, to, to um, jump ahead and say, well, let's make a map. We have, so we have a gadget here. We pulled spatial data. And let's talk about what, how we're going to do this. In our, in our example, we call it utility QGIS. So we're talking about a GIS system. What is GIS? Well, Wikipedia has a perfectly serviceable answer for what a GIS is. And it's basically a way that you're looking at geographic data with software tools that you, so you can visualize it, you can analyze it, you can actually just work with it. And for us, there's a lot of different GIS tools you can use. Um, probably most people who are familiar with GIS are familiar with ArcGIS. That is the industry standard, it's commercial. There's an entire ecosystem built around Esri products. Uh, we do support these at the university, but they're actually quite expensive. Uh, we have open source things, uh, QGIS, which we're talking about today, RAS, which is another alternative. Uh, and these are, again, open source, they're free, they, they're not as commercial. We'll get to that in a second. And you might be familiar with other tools for GIS that you can use Google Earth in a way. You can use Python or R to actually work with spatial data and, then, and to kind of serve as a GIS. You can do a lot of mapping in Python and R. And there's also web GIS and different websites which will allow you to explore GIS data. These are becoming less common. And what is actually becoming more common is used for, again, Esri, QGIS, and things like Python or R. So what we're talking about here is QGIS, and we'll use their definition, a free and open source geographic information system. This allows you, again, to look at and to model the spatial information. Um, all of you should have probably should have installed QGIS before this workshop, but if not, QGIS.org. And then it has a per and it is a cross-platform, wonderful tool. So what is it, what are some capabilities of this thing? It's free. You don't have to spend as much as my first car cost to actually use GIS software. You can just download the QGIS. It allows you to do all this. You can display stuff, you analyze it, it you can edit it. It's a full featured thing for dealing with geospatial information. It, it allows you to create digital maps. So you can create map images. You can create, actually through different plugins, map websites, all through QGIS. It supports all the common geospatial features. So points, polygons, lines, you're not losing anything by using it. And it supports a lot of spatial file formats. We're gonna get into some of those today. It is cross-platform. It works on your Mac. Esri stuff, not so much. Esri on the web, kind of, but if you wanna use full-blown ArcGIS, you're stuck in Windows. QGIS works on Macs, Linux, Windows, you name it, it works. Um, there's some drawbacks to this. I mean, it, it's not commercial, so there's no dedicated free support. They can't call up the QGIS helpline and say, hey, I broke all my spatial data, can you help me? No, that's not gonna happen. QGIS is still not an industry standard package. That you're not gonna find a lot of GIS classes or geography classes actually teaching QGIS. They'll mostly do Esri simply because of Esri's commercial status. And QGIS is not part of that Esri ecosystem. They can't seamlessly you know, use your QGIS to push to an Esri at mapping application. You can take your data and you can do, do things, but there's no seamless hands-on, hands-offs. And it does lack some of the commercial tools and features that Esri has. Some of the really intricate analysis QGIS does not have. But on the flip side, there's some capabilities that, I, that QGIS has that Esri doesn't. And on the whole, I've pretty much exclusively switched to using QGIS myself, mostly because I'm a Mac user. And also because I just like a lot of the features that QGIS has, like being able to edit multiple layers at the same time. So before we start though, before we even talk about GIS things, and for those of you who already know about GIS, you probably know where this is headed. What are we using to look at a map? And why could this be a problem? And again, I'll open up that up for people at home as well. What, what could be, why? What are we using to look at electronic maps and why could this be an issue? Our, the physical thing itself. We're looking at it on a screen, a flat screen, right? And why is this a problem? Well, the Earth doesn't look like this. 
If you think the earth does look like this, please drive down to Long Beach this evening and watch as the boats go down over the horizon. They sink, they don't fall off the edge. So the earth is not flat. Since the earth is not flat, we've got to, we've got to basically do something about that, right? We've got to find a way of transforming this oblong spheroid into something that can be seen on a screen. Now, this, this is done through a geographic coordinate system. That's where you say where you are on your surface. And a projection then takes that and turns that into a flat image. Um, why am I saying this? Because you're going to find data that's not projected the way that you think it is. And this could be completely stupefying until you figure out, wait a second, that's in a different projection. Or that's in a weird projection I've never heard of you. Most data you'll find is probably 4326. We'll, we'll see what that is in QJS. Web Mercator, that's the stuff from like Google Maps, that's in 3857. And there's all kinds of other stuff. And the ESPG say, what is that? That is your Euro European Petroleum Survey Group. So yes, we're basic, a lot of our GIS software is based on finding oil, for better or for worse. And we say, well, why do we care about projections? Um, give me a thumbs up if this is how you grew up looking at maps. I'm going to assume that's probably everybody that's going to give me a thumbs up. This is it. It's the Mercator projection. It is great if you're, say, in Europe and you want to come over and kill people, take their stuff and go back and forth. It's great for navigation. There's some problems with this. I mean, Greenland isn't that big, but there's most of the things, actually. Well, let's, let's see this. What's wrong? What is wrong with this map? Upside down. Okay, we got a, it's upside down. <laughs> well, what does that even mean? We're on the long sphere, right? right? Like, why, why can't the south be on the top of the map? It's, there's no reason for it not to be. We're, we're just looking at, I mean, the, the solar plane is the solar plane, so why not look at it that way? What about the relative sizes here? I mean, if we look back at this, the United States takes up almost all of Africa, right? Eh, nope. And you may say, well, why do we care? No, it's not intuitive for most audiences. Yeah, because we grew up with this, right? This is what we've been looking at since you could walk into school. You look at this, you go, wait, what's happening here? And we can get into wonderful humanities problems of this because here's the actual size of Africa when things are projected the same. We're actually looking at an equal area thing. You can see the United States is much smaller than what it looks like on that map. You know what else is much smaller? Russia. For those of you who grew up in the Cold War, and we're looking at the Mercator map, Russia is this enormous northern beast of a country. You look at it, it's like, eh, it's not that much bigger. So this gives you kind of an interesting work view of the world. And it's something to keep in mind as we're making maps. Every map that we make is these decisions. It's these choices that we make to represent something. And whatever projection we're using, whatever place that we're focusing on, we're going to be telling a story whether we like it or not. There's a wonderful book called How to Lie with Maps. I wish that everyone would read that because it is true. Every map that we produce is a lie to some extent. We just have to figure out how we're lying and you know, lie gracefully, I guess. And if you want to look at wonderful projections, go to this website. You'll see all, all just a ton of different map projections that you can choose from. And you can you actually use a lot of these in QGIS. If you can use your 4326 data, your Mercator data, and reproject it on the fly to produce something like this. So just something to keep in mind. And again, why do you care? You're going to find data that's not the projection you think it is. You're going to want to reproject it. You're going to want to use it. And this can be a challenge. We're going to actually have a little bit of a challenge today about data produced by the city of Los Angeles which you might have some problems mapping. So just to give you a quick overview of what data we're gonna be mapping is, raster and vector. If you've heard of raster and vectors before. And for data and JS, it's primarily these two things. So rasters, it's, a, it's an image. It's an image organized in a grid. This is really often used for the base layer of maps like elevation kind of ideas. And you'll see that each one of these grids has a value. Each one of these are often correspond to pixels. Um, we have, this is, again, they have bands. They have single bands, which are used mostly for elevation land use. That's just a value. Or multi-bands, which are used for, for images. Those are 
as you can see here, red, blue, and green. So if you see a photograph on a GIS platform, it's a multi-band raster most, most of the time. And each one of these has a value. And now this is kind of interesting. Each, let's say that this is elevation and this is in meters. What does this value actually mean? It could be the average of all the different elevation things in that cell. It could be the highest, it could be the lowest. It could be the elevation at the midpoint of that cell. So you can see there's a lot of abstractions that happen when you're dealing with rasters. But again, we, we do this because if you're doing something like the Earth's elevation, you don't want to model every square inch of the Earth as an information thing. We don't have the computational power to do that. So we're, we're abstracting these rasters. And rasters do not have any attribute data themselves. You may have tables that are associated with them, saying if this pixel, this value means something. The raster itself won't. So here, this would be like a raster that would just have numerical values here. These are meaningless unless you actually have those tables, which are an external file somewhere else telling you what those actually mean. So those will never part of your raster. The raster does not have attributes. It is an image that is georeferenced that you're telling the computer where, where to put this stuff. And so let's pull one into QGIS. Yes, we're finally turning far enough to QGIS, right? And so this is go to naturalearthdata.com and grab the Natural Earth 2 with Shader Relief in Water. That's one we're going to be looking at for the workshop, or you can grab any other one that you wish. So I'll give you guys a second to do that. And we're going to bring up some tasks that we're going to look at. So again, how are we going to do this? How are we going to inter interface with these rasters? And I'll stop sharing my screen for a second so I can bring up my own QGIS. And you'll see that QGIS and Zoom do not play well together because it considers each one of its windows an independent entity. I would have to share my entire desktop. So you'll probably see myself three times over. Sorry, that's just, oh, that's just the modern world that we live in. So let me share my screen and you'll see that here we are in QGIS. So you fire, fire this up, um, you know, you've got options. I've got some projects that I was working on. We're just gonna do a new empty project. So project new. Great, we have a, a blank screen. Now there's a few ways that you can bring in this natural earth data that we just downloaded. And in fact, let's take a look at the natural earth data. So if you downloaded it, you'll see that it came, it came in as this wonderful cryptic natural earth two blah blah. Okay, be a day. And you'll see there's several different files in here. The tip, this is the actual image itself. It's got a version full text that tells you what version it is. That's really exciting. It's got a projection file that helps the computer actually tell you where to place everything and some readme's and some overviews. So what how you can bring this to the QJS is you can go to layer, add layer, add a raster layer, and point to it. Or you can be kind of lazy with what I am and just try to I, I like doing that. So uh, as a digital humanities person, I'm always trying to find a shortcut for doing for doing something. So bring that in and you'll see that it shows up. Now, what kind of raster do you think this is? Take a guess of how many bands. As you, I mean, if you brought it in, you could probably just look right at your at your screen. How many bands do you think this is, and why? Multi. All right, multi-band. Yep, red, green, and blue. So, and then over here, you can see. Oh, look, this is our projection. We're three two six. We pull it in. We're projecting this at the standard Mercator projection. There it is. We. This is the map that we all grew up with. We feel good about this, right? This looks good, this looks right. This is our map. So let's do a couple of things with this thing. Let's go back to our task. We brought it in. And now, what's our next task? Well, we saw a couple of ways at it. You go to File, Add Layer, Add Raster, we're just dragging it in. Let's look at the file properties. Let's see what, what, what can the QJS tell us about this thing we just brought in. So if you right click on anything, Go down to properties, 
You see, oh, hey, you make this you can change the capacity. That's kind of fun. There, see, you can see through. Doesn't really, there's nothing behind it, so that's really not that important. But what else do we have? We have information about this. A name, it tells us the size, what's modified it. It tells us, oh, look at this, the extent of the greens that you have. It tells you what kind of data type it is, the different bands and the different information about each one of those. And here's the real, one of the real important parts, the coordinate reference system. It tells us that it recognizes the 74326, what it's based on. And, and again, all of your different bands, your, your counts, what kind of data you have. So you actually can get a lot of information bringing this into QGIS. The symbology, well, we're, this is, you can actually mess around with the colors a little bit. You can turn off the bands, you can turn them on. You can get some really interesting visual effects. We're not gonna do that so much with this because this is designed to look a certain way. And so let's do another thing. Let's identify one of these pixels. Let's go into LA. Hey, look, that's, we're still looking pretty good. Oh Lord, what happened here? Why are we getting this thing looking like this? Any thoughts? We zoom in, we're not even to, I mean, this is like the greater LA area, right? And it's just, it looks awful. Why? The right, the rash levels. These are the, these are the, the uh, scale of it. And you can see that this is the size of the pixels that we're using. If we had a more detailed one, it'd be even more detailed then. So let's just take a look. And if you go to your tools here, as I struggle with the zoom control the way, if you do this, this is an identification. It's really useful to see what something is. So let's go to one of these. You'll see that it, this is the information that it has. This is your band colors. That's it. No other information about it. And so, cool, you can identify stuff. All right, this is not, oh, there's my mic. This is not quite good enough for, say, a lot of the work you want to do, right? It's not quite good enough for getting for scale. So let's look at a, a really cool option here. This is something that's very new. Is if we go to our plugins and we want to manage and install plugins, and we look for SRTM, go ahead and install the SRTM downloader. Now what this does is actually pulls much more highly detailed scaled rasters from, from the NASA's website. This is a shuttle research mission and they basically, our tax money put a shuttle in, this, in the air to basically laser scan the earth and we have some great elevation data. Normally this is really a complicated process of getting these digital elevation maps. This plugin, it's a lot easier. So um, you go in, you install that plugin, it, it tells you where Register and let's just zoom into somewhere. Yeah, this is Los Angeles enough. We're, we're, we're about right here, right? So we're about right here. And if we go look at our plugin now, our data downloader, we say set the canvas extent. That's the extent that we're, we're dealing with. We want to have an output path. You want to save these things. You don't want them to be temporary. As useful as QGIS is, it will crash. You're going to want to save your data and save things possible. So we're gonna just dump this in, oh, I don't know, our desktop, good enough. And then we're gonna name it, and you'll see that I already have my, you'll have to register for the US site. Um, if you're concerned about your information, this is the US government, they already know everything they want to know about you anyway. So we'll just go ahead and hit okay. And you'll see that I'm going to be downloading these images. And look at that. I've now got four SRTM ones. So these, if you zoom in, you can see these are actually much more detailed. See, we can go into here and you can see, wow, I can actually see a lot of that stuff where if we were to turn these off, you're getting massive squares. Now we're gonna do something with this. We get, let's do a couple of tasks here because these are, while well, they're interesting, uh, they're kind of hard to look at and kind of hard to see what's going on, right? And so let's style these things. And so we looked at this, and now let's style these, merge them, and actually make something that's useful. And so a lot of times when you have background data, 
you'll find that there's not an adequate background data for your, for your project. So you'll use something like this to start building it, but then you want to style it, you want it to not look like this, right? So easy way to do this is we select them. You just you hold down shift, select all of them, and you can right click on them, you can group them. <laughs> but we don't want it to, so a lot of times if you have similar raster and similar things, you can group them. We want to actually merge them. So we're gonna to go to raster. We're going to go to, uh, we want to miscellaneous and then merge. And we want to input our layers. So faster, miscellaneous, merge. The QJS likes to move menu options around a lot with different versions. Just be aware of that. And I want to say, hey, we want to merge these rasters we just pulled in. And we can say that that's useful and OK. Say, all right, fine. We want to dump again. We want to save to a file because we don't want to lose any of this that happens to all the way. SRT and workshop. Great. And we'll say it's a TIFF file or output. And then we will say run. Great. And you'll see. Look at that. What happened? We've merged it all. And now you can see it's actually consistently styled. We no longer have those kind of things. We have a big block. All right. That's pretty cool. But we want to do a little bit more with it, right? So let's say, okay, let's style this thing. Let's actually do it by elevation. So we want to have some hill shades. We want to have some, some styles for our elevation behind it. And so we to do this, you actually have to have two of the same file. So you got to have one below it, which is going to be your hill shade, and one above it, which is going to be your elevation. So we're going to right click on this. We're going to duplicate our layer. You'll see that we have a copy in this. So I want to show the um, this is going to describe what we're about to do with the hill shade. I just want to show you what these options are so you understand what's happening. You'll have the altitude, the, the, the azimuth, and the z factor for creating the hill shade. Excuse me. What this does is the altitude is the degree of the angle of the source. Azimuth is what angle it's actually hitting the source at. <coughs> and the z factor is basically. An exaggeration of how tall or, or short something you should say two, three, four, and we're going to show you all this stuff in a second. So, we're going to go that's just describing what these options are. Now, let's actually do it. So, if we go and we double click on this thing, we're going to get to our properties here. And we want to say we want to change our symbology here. So, it says render type. We want to change this to a hill shape. Well, if we hit OK right now, you see, oh, nothing's changed. Well, because I get to the one under it. Let's turn the one over it off by this check mark. And you'll see, wow, that looks cool. That's hill shape. <laughs> Let's zoom in a little bit more. So, and you'll see that these hills are now rather exaggerated. And let's see, well, if we turn those off, and let's turn off our other SRTM things, you can see. That's our natural earth. This is a this is a lot more plus this is a this is a lot better of a resolution, right? And so we put that on. And now well, let's work on the that's cool. That'll be give us it's kind of a, a shade of the background. And again, you can play around with these parameters. We can say it's a factor of say three. You see that doesn't change too much. The Z factor of one. Smooths, the, smooths it out a little. Let's change where, the, it, where that's coming from. And you can see how that really changes down here. Now the light's coming from this direction. And so you can always, you can change this around. Basically, however you think it looks best for what you're trying to do. We'll just keep it like that for now. Now over it, we want to have a, a color space and let's say elevation. So it was, let's double click on the one that's over it. All right, single band gray is not what we're going for anymore, is it? Let's go for, it's a single band raster, we still not. So let's go for pseudo color. You'll see something like this. And let's do a color ring. What that does is say, okay, according to whatever value, the pixel value on the raster, that's this, we're going to assign it. In this case, it's elevation. And you know this by looking at SRTM's documentation. So we'll go here, and this is clunky, but interesting. 
Let's go to create a new color ramp. None of these are really adequate. And then you select a type. And if you go to our catalog, catalog CPT City, and OK, you'll see that it has a massive catalog of different kinds of color ramps. And that uh, you can see, all right, hey, topography. And you can see, oh, right, some of these look kind of cool. We can, uh, oh, we have some bathymetry, right? So we have some that data. All right, I kind of like this wiki one. If you hover your mouse over it, it'll tell you that this is really designed for 29 colors and discrete stuff. Mm -hmm. So let's hit cancel. We'll say that this is discrete. We'll say that, well, maybe equal interval. This is, you can play around with these values and I'll say 29. And then you'll see that this change we're not too concerned about that at the moment. We can say is different kinds of values. So we hit classify, equal interval 29. There's 29 values that are classified. Then we hit apply. You see that now we have we have that. Okay, well let's you can again change these up. Let's just do um we can do linear again, classify. You can set all these kinds of things, like what's the value of 10, then it gets like from 10 meters to 91 meters to 192, so on and so on. It's whatever values you actually happen to have. So continuous, classify, there you go. And so um, let's you know, refresh that as the military trees, that's cool. Now we can go back through, we can again create a new color ramp and assign, again, I'm just showing you this. Two, okay, and hit apply. And now Los Angeles looks like kind of the ocean. <laughs> and that's kind of neat. And you can go through it and change that saying, all right, 84 should probably be even kind of green or whatever. So you can spend a lot of time, I'm just really quickly showing you what's capable of this thing you can do in terms of looking at that. Now we want to make this a hill shade. See, and all we got to do for that is actually just decrease our transparency a bit. So we go down to our layer to our um, transparency, put this down to say 70%. And now you've got a nice shaded relief map. Now again, this is kind of absurd. Although given global warming, this might actually be what the Los Angeles basin looks like in a hundred years. But you kind of get the idea there. You play around with those parameters, and you can have something that looks quite good. Uh, any questions so far? Yes. Um, from the plugin that you use to bring in this um, 33 percent scanning data, right? Yes, it's like, federal research data. Um, is is that done? Like, is there a, is it done by year? So could it would the scans look different? Oh no! It's some. This is a. It's a one product. Kind one of. product. So yeah. it's from one specific time, and you can use that. Exactly. So if people are studying changes in landscape, they might compare mm -hmm. that scan to a scan that they did to see the difference. Exactly. So you can bring in like light lidar data, say, right. and say, okay, this is lidar data from one year to another, to another, to another. Okay. Um, and for rasters, again, you're, you'd be overlaying this, so it wouldn't be so much precision as like just see these very big changes. And how far back? Um, this is just this data from the plugin is just the shot, and so I think it was done in the late '90s, early 2000s. And it's it's elevation data, so it hasn't changed that much. Now, if you want to get into other kinds of data, we'll talk about that in a second. Vectors, and that's where you're really getting things like changing ocean levels and that kind of thing. All right? So, I'm following along so far. Cool, and so. We can just quick overview what rasters are. They're great for this kind of stuff, for elevation data. They're showing these big, you know, changes over time. They're great for images and photographs. So if you have aerial photos, you're gonna have a raster and you're probably gonna associate with something. They're, they're great if you're just trying to show, again, a quick graph where you're not really getting really into what the attribute data is. We go back to our example. I'm just making a map here. I'm not saying that this is the ocean, I'm just making a quick raster and show you. What well, it also works too computationally expensive to model the data. You can't have every square foot of LA be its own point information. That's not going to happen. If we get into even things like LIDAR, 
And there's a lot of data there, but it gets flattened as a raster. Like you're not looking at every data point at a certain point. You're just flattening it so you need GIS. That being said, rasters are not great for features. They're not great for looking at, like, say, buildings or points or here's an object. They don't really give you a lot of attribute data. As you can see from here, it's hard to get really granular with a raster. It's hard to like really get into these, these micro details. And they're also kind of poor in querying information. If you're only having, you know, external tables, this kind of stuff, you're trying to query, that's a mess. So what do we want to do? Well, let's look at vectors. What is a vector? Well, it's a, it's a way to represent those features, those name entities, those places that we were talking about. And anything that has a geospatial component can be a vector. What's great about them is this is where you can do things like trace a river. This would be a vector in a GIS. It's an actual line. We're seeing where it goes. Now, you may say, well, rivers change and where the actual river line is, we can argue that, but you can trace like a satellite middle of the river. Perfectly, perfectly good example. Lakes, buildings, roads, you can add points. This is, this is where a vector is going for you. And they have their X and Y coordinates, sometimes C for elevation. If you are familiar with image manipulation software, vector raster, this is exactly what it is only in GIS form. And mostly they're points, lines, and polygons. That's what you're gonna encounter, 99.9%. .9%. You're gonna find different kinds of formats. And I just wanna go with this for a second because this stuff is somewhat contentious, um, occasionally confusing, and there are definitely lines in the sand and shoes being thrown over this kind of thing. So one thing that is the industry standard is the shape file. That is an Esri proprietary file format. It's the de facto industry standard. You will find shape files everywhere. You can open them in QGIS, no problem. You can edit them, you can use them. Um, we'll get into what a shape file looks like in a minute. It has multiple files that are within it. And, but there are limitations to shape files. You can't have attribute names that go over a certain number of characters. You can't have some of the same you can't have some of the same attribute information that you can have in other formats. What's nice about it is it's spatially indexed. You're not drawing or loading into memory everything all the time using the shape. One of the, on the contrary, the GeoJSON, if you're familiar with JSON object notation, that's what this is with the geospatial component. It's human readable, it's designed for the web. You can look at a GeoJSON file and immediately say, I know what's going on here. It's fantastic. It's essentially a text file. It doesn't have a spatial index. If you're using GeoJSON, you're loading everything all the time. That can be a problem if you've got millions of points or hundreds of thousands of points trying to bring it to a web application. You, you kind of you see where that's going. They can't have slower performance than, say, a shape power or geo package. I personally like GeoJSON a lot. Then again, I'm not dealing with billions of points most of the time, or millions of points. I'm dealing with hundreds or possibly thousands. Even then, I see a little bit of slowdown. But I like GeoJSON because I like the JSON format. I like being able to read what's going on. I like to have as much text attributes as I can, as to my heart's content, that I can possibly cram in there. The new kit on the block is this thing called GeoPackage, which is being pushed by QGIS. Um, this is an open source, open format, so great for linked open data applications. If you know what SQLite is, it's actually built on the idea of each file is its own self contained SQLite database. So there's a lot of really interesting spatial indexing that you can do with it, a lot of interesting querying. There's a lot of fast performance. It just hasn't really been adopted by a lot of people yet. So it's something to keep your eye on, that these are the primary things you'll get. You also get CSV files. So we're going to be importing some of those in a minute. But these are the specific geospatial vector files. That would really be so far. All right? And so, Go, if you go to the GitHub page or you can go to LA um, city site and grab the following spatial data. This one, Justice Equity Services in LA, um, the index zip code. So go ahead and download that. There's also, and these links are also in, on the uh, website. So you can just go grab them quickly. We have the income per capita. And I want you to grab that as a GeoJSON file. Hence the important download this as a GeoJSON. And the last one is, I want you to download as a CSV, the Community Business Enterprise Point Locations. So this is all equity data being published by the city of LA. And we want to put it together and we want to start mapping. That's the idea. 
And LA is actually ahead of most cities offering this kind of stuff. A lot of times you'll have to call and get what their map, like they'll give you an image on a map and you'll have to geo-rectify and find all this stuff out. LA is at least nice enough to, to put all this stuff on a map for us. I would guess because of our proximity to Redlands and Esri, which is based in Redlands, but you know, who knows? So our task is we want to bring in these vector files into QGIS. We want to look at the data itself. We're going to use an identifier tool. We're going to look at the attribute table. We're going to see how, how do you look at stuff in QGIS? We're going to see how to style this stuff. We're going to look at how you label it, how you filter it, how you edit it. And then we're going to say, we're going to create our own vector. So that is our goal. And let's get started. So again, you can go through and you can say, we go to project, you can, oh, you go to layer, you can add layer and add vector layers. You can add the um, delimited layer. That's how you bring in the, the uh, CSV file. Or again, you can just drag it. So, so I'm going to assume that you've downloaded the files already. If you haven't, go ahead and, and download them. Um, you'll, you can write a 500 word essay about downloading stuff or workshop. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's let's start with probably the easiest one, which would be the shape file. And so we'll see here, just a second, these services. It comes in a directory. And we say, wait, a shape file, why, why is this coming in a directory, right? What's happening here? Well, let's look, open that up. And you'll see all the different components of a shape file. A shape file is kind of a misnomer. It's the, the, the SHP, it's collecting all this other information, packaging it together, and putting it into how your GIS can read it. So you'll see that we have things like an XML thing about our zip codes there. You've got the shapefile index, the shapefile itself, projection file that tells us what projection it's in, the geo database stuff, and so on. If you're ever doing those kind of things, you'll find that you start generating all these different files for shapefiles. I'd say always make a directory and dump one on one on one. You don't want to have multiple shape files in one directory, because then you delete some, some SHP or some you know, projection files, suddenly you can't use them. So that's one reason I don't make shape files. I don't like keeping track of all this stuff. So again, you can um, just, because QGIS is smart enough to look for all the things associated with shape file, you can just drive the shape file in, or you can import it again doing um, layer and layer. So I just I want to be lazy again, and we'll bring this in. And you'll see that it tells me, okay, both operations, there's different coordinates that are going on here. And let's say, okay, fine, we already know that it's smart enough to say it needs to be, it's in this NDA 83 projection. We want to put it in WGS 84, which is our, what our project's in. We hit okay. And then all your zip codes, look at that. And buses are in. If you select a little hand thing or hold on your space bar, you can rotate it in. Let's get all of our shape files in there. Now it renders these in order. So I could actually drag these, say behind our semi-transparent layer, and you can see them now they're there. So that's a very quick way of just moving stuff up and down and around. So let's move the below there. So these are all of our things. So let's look at what can we do with this? Well. We right click on it, again, we can go to our properties and it'll give us our information about what this thing is. It tells us all the different files that are associated with this shape file. It tells us, hey, this is a UTF-8 coding, that's fantastic. Ah, right here, this is the coordinate reference, this is its native coordinate re reference system, 2229 NDA. And we can look that up, ESPG2229 online and see what actually is involved in that. It tells you all of your fields, even though it won't tell you what those fields mean. And so this is kind of the responsibility of somebody who produces these files to so make a nice readme file to tell you what each one of these attributes are. And I would say that's something that you should get in the practice of doing for yourself, because you may use shortcuts. And in six months from now, you say, what does DBF21 mean in my columns? I have no idea. Uh, this what, what is this abbreviation I used? I don't know. So it's not just helping other people. Think of documentation as a love letter to your future self saying, this is what we've got to do. All right, so those are those basic things. And we can zoom in 
And because these are vectors, notice that they do not ever lose resolution. It's just between two points. So that's pretty cool. And if we go to our identify, we can identify each one. You'll see that it gives us all the information about it. So this is why all these different kinds of things. This is a um, lowest of whatever that category is, and so on. Now let's let's neat. Let's style this thing, right? Let's let's make this actually kind of useful to us. So again, let's double click, click on this, and let's go to symbology. And you'll see we have on the top a single symbol. So we can make this thing like, oh, that looks like a Macintosh Ferris works in the early 90s, doesn't it? But that's not really helping to us. Let's do this based on some kind of property of the data itself. So we'll say categorized. And if we go, we just select whatever value that is. Um, let's say, this is like probably physical health, let's say physical health. And what we can do is we classify it and I'll have these numbers. And we can look through and say, oh, what's another, what's another um, category? Maybe, oh, that one. And classify it, and it'll tell us, again, so it's just based on whatever your data happens to be. Um, if, if you know what kind of data you're using, you might say, okay, oh, well, I'll classify. Let, let's just say these numbers are from well, some kind of color map. We'll do then let's go back to our ramp and we'll say let's do a um we don't want random colors so let's just do blues for instance hit apply so let's do that classify oh i'm sorry I'm gonna do the wrong symbols fill and hit okay and we will go back to our symbol categorize our symbol Change our color red to whatever it is, and you can say it based on whatever properties you have. So, in this case, again, we'll do blues. We'll say that it is based on our that. We will apply, we will classify, and you can change whatever these symbols happen to be. So, we'll say gray, red, whatever. So, high could be gray, moderate could be that, and you'll see that this starts actually changing the colors that you have on, on the screen. So that's one way of looking at it. Again, this is kind of a mess, but this is just examples only. I would never make a map that looks like this. Never have I made a map that looks like this, honest, but you kind of get the idea. You go through, you look at your data, and then you can also do things like filtering. So if we go here, we say, all right, this is all this kind of stuff. Um, we can classify, we can apply it, we can look at the source, you can build a uh, query here. And let's say that we only want housing categories that are equal to the lowest. We can apply. You'll see that these are now all the only the lowest housing categories that, that LA is recognized. So that's how you can filter this kind of stuff. So, what the question? Is that the intersection of two? Yeah, yeah. So, we have now, we've filtered it and we've styled it according to our filter. So, that's how you can start doing this kind of work. So, let's, do, let's examine another one that we have. Let's pull the second one we have, which was a GeoJSON file, right? This is the census tracks, the GeoJSON. And we'll pull that in. And you'll see that that's a name again. There's a lot of polygons, we're gonna add layers. Boom, it's pretty, again, easy enough for GeoJSON. Same kind of thing. We can identify what it is. District five, in, income per cap. Okay, that maybe that's a good way to style this one. So if we go, we go to our properties. Let's go to our symbology. We'll again do a uh, categorize. We will say, we wanna base this on income per cap. We want to do a color rail. I can classify. Sure. <laughs> this will look insane, but you know what? Why not? And there is your color map of your income categories. Now you're starting to see maps that are a lot more useful, right? Like that you can model this kind of thing. Any questions so far about that? 
Great. Now let, I want you now to do a, an exercise. And we're going to bring in the, um, oops, and I'll do that. Sorry. We will do this automatically. We'll bring in our community business point locations. So this is a CSV file that we just exported out. So we will get layer. This time we're actually going to do it this way because this is how you bring in a CSV file. You have to do it funky way to, to identify which fields are, are which. So let's go ahead and add our limited text layer. We will go find out where it is. And we will say that it is our community business locations. Okay. So X and Y. And so this one automatically comes up. This one was smart enough to realize that we were in this California zone. And if we add it, close it, you'll see. And let's make a suggestion. Look at all those points. Now, this, there could be a problem though. You could add this, and the CSV file itself does not have an internal projection to it. And where do you think you would find that if QGIS could not recognize what an objection was? If we go to the site for the resource, so this is where we got from, where do you think we could find the projection here? We have the license details. We have this is the information, this is the more info about it. So that's not very helpful. Oh, beautiful details, maybe? Right, it could be put in the file. In this case, it was. We were, well, in this case, it actually wasn't. But QGIS recognized because we brought in another one that was the same projection. So this is kind of a trick question because this is actually, believe it or not, rather difficult to get to. So we can't do it through. It's like we can find that it took me a while to get the information from the server. And then if you actually look there, you can find it buried in everything. You will actually find the projection. And it's hard, it's hard to find this stuff. There it is, the spatial reference, but right there's the EPSG. And so you might have to, you know, kind of dig around to find these things. And if you're if you wonder, oh, what is the EPSG for that? This is what it is, the California time zone. And you can see what, what that actually tells you about balance. So otherwise, you might not be able to use this thing. And so again, something to keep in mind, you might have a CSV file. And if you look at this one, if you're used to 4326, you can see it's these crazy numbers. I'm not used to the California um, APSG 2229. I've never used that before this workshop. And so it took me forever to figure out what the actual projection of this thing was. So I brought that in first before bringing in anything else. And QGS did not know how to do it. But I brought, since I brought in the other ones, it says, all right, this might be one that I've already used. I understand what's happening with this projection. Mm -hmm. So the order that you bring in files, even if you don't want to show them in that order, is sometimes important. Mm -hmm. And so, <clears throat> yes. You reorder. Yes. Them, and then that would reorder the. Um, the drawing. Yeah. So I can pull like this below. So now the points are below that order. Uh, yeah, it's just simply dragging them like that. And that would reshift the projection as well. Oh, uh, no, that just shifts the drawing. Oh, just the drawing. Now, if you want to reshift the projection down here in the corner, <coughs> see it's in 456, we can put it into the other ones that we have. Let's do the California one. We apply. So you can see your uh, the other data that you brought in and it's back to a different projection. Exactly. Got it. So now let's pull this all into say web mercade, the web mercade one. And I'll say okay, why? <coughs> and you'll see that this shifts around a little bit. Let's so we'll pull back and forth between two states because that's what we're all used to, and that's what makes us all comfortable. See? You can see how, how that changes our slightly. Now, you can go all kinds of crazy ones. Um, you know, like, I don't know what that one is. That <laughs> would probably not be very useful. And it gives you an idea of what the spatial coverage is within, within uh, this little map here. So you can say, like, we probably don't want to use a Tokyo projection, but all the same, let's see what happens. Yeah, not too much because we're not at Tokyo. 
And so you can just, you can just mess around with that and you can reproject it like Lambert from formal counting and arguments. So that's how you deal with the projections. Now, while we're here again, you can style this. Let's style the business enterprise thing. And this is actually kind of important if depending on the order that you style these, if you want to show on the not to show. So let's do a um, size. Now let's base our size. You see this little helper box here? Bring it to the assistant, and we can base our size, size on whatever it happens to be. Now, for us, there's X, Y, and ID. We'll say vendor number. Again, still a you know, really silly example, <coughs> excuse me, but you can base this on, like, say, a population figure or whatever you have. And you say refresher and you can shoot these numbers. And so we'll size it based on whatever vendor number you have on the page. We hit OK. You now see that our circles are sized to that variable. That's kind of cool. But let's also do a categorized model while we're at it. And let's say a category based on the business type. If we classify those, you now see that each one of these business types has a different color value. I hit apply. Look at that. We are sized by our by that numerical value. You have to do that first. And then you can colorize it based on another category. So now you have a map that looks like something you'd probably find a Chuck E. Cheese. But you can kind of get the idea of, what, of how, how to style all this. And again, we can filter these values based on whatever queries we want to build. So we can go back to our information. Now, this will give you everything about it. Our source, and we can build our query. We can say, like, where business type equals, you know, healthcare and the, um, you know, the expiration date is less than, we'll say here. And if we, we, you can always touch your query. This will give us 10 rows, actually. We hit OK. And we'll see that's our criteria. And it's met. And then if we right click on this and open our attribute table, here's the 10 of them that we have. This gives us all the information about it. That you just essentially filtered for. Exactly. Wow. And so there's all your information about these things. You can export this as a CSV. You can um, export this as a own layer. You can, again, identify it on the fly. And so that's how you find that kind of information. Now, that's all well and good. Let's turn off our query and actually start messing around with this thing a little bit more. So let's just. And I'm just going to clear it, hit OK. So we've got, so let's say you want to add something within QGIS. What you do is you just start editing your layers. And so you can see that, wait, I can't edit this. You can't edit a CSV file that you brought in. You, can't, you can only edit GeoJSON or shape files. This is something that catches a lot of people. It's like, oh, I want to change, make changes. Well, no, this is being pulled from a CSV file. So you can't actually change it directly. What you can do, is export this thing out as whatever format you want and then adapt. And so let's do a couple, let's see how we would do that in this case. Like, oh, I've styled this. Oh, I forgot it was a CSV. I want, I want to make my changes. Well, first thing we can do is if we go to styles, we can copy it or we can save our style. So if we say copy styles, we can copy all of our style categories. We'll get to that, why we want to do that in a second. So the first thing let's do, let's export this thing out. So we'll export it and we'll save our features as, and you've got, see, default is the geo package, the new one I was talking about, or a shape file, or a geojson. Let's just do a geojson for sake of argument. And we'll call this you know, file out. You guys want to be very creative. And you got to say where it's actually going. So there it is, file out.geojson, layer name, whatever, it doesn't matter. And you can, there's lots of parameters here, but we're just saving it as it is. So we're not going to modify it, we're just saving it out. And add save files in. Great. Now you'll see that, oh, I want to preserve all my styling, right? So let's just go to copy style, all style categories, and styles, case style. 
There we go. Wasn't that fantastic? And you can actually do that before between integrators. So you style a point layer the way that you like it. We have similar data from another point layer. You can copy and paste over it. Same with like say rivers or something. So if you have a river style you like, then you get more rivers from our data source. You can just copy and paste it over. So we want to edit this thing now. See the little pencil? If you click on that, it'll toggle our editing. And then we have options. We can add a feature. We can select a feature. We can do all kinds of fun things here. So let's add, we add a feature here. You'll see that it has all the different things that are in our attribute table. We put in the X, the Y, the IV, vendor numbers, names, checkboxes. Basically, you can just keep building these things. This is really useful if you're using QGIS, for instance, to say trace rivers or to trace a map to bring in. That's beyond, say, this workshop. But if you're interested, we can get to a raster tracing workshops where we can do workshops on georeferencing, which will really show you the power of this. The other thing you can do is we can, if we open our attribute table, once we have our editing on, we can actually edit on the table directly. So that'll change your feature stuff there. And when you're all done, you just click on the pencil and we'll save it all, save your edits. Um, as you're editing, you see this little thing looks like this. Click that constantly, that is saving. Again, if you're using an update, you, it's not a question of if you will crash, it's a question of when you will crash. So let's say you, you've got a map here and you want to share this wonderful creation of the world. I have no idea why you want to save this particular one, but let's get into what do you do with this stuff now that you have in QJS? So you know now how to pull in a raster. You know how to style a raster. You know how to pull in this kind of data. Oh, we forgot to pull in our wonderful in and out data. I put that in my downloads folder. This is our in and out data that we pulled from before. We're going to add the layers. Ah, oh, yeah, look at that. That's all of our in and out data. We'll, we'll make this one a little more transparent so you can see this wonderful riot of colors that we have going on here. And we will, and you'll see that we'll start off the polygon how's that. And we'll style this one because we're in and out uh, some crazy marker. There you go. <laughs> so this gives you a map of, well, actually, this is kind of interesting. The lowest housing does not actually have any in and outs in it. Right there, we've now discovered something that is. That actually be a very interesting study just by meshing together different data sets. We can talk about equity and in and out. Um, so this is, so you go in and say, all right, I want to print this area. You go to project and you go to new print layout and title it whatever you want. I say make a title that you actually understand because as you're making different print layouts, again, you might want to go back and see what's going on. Well, but I'll just call this the base because why not? And you're presented with this wonderful screen. And this is where UI designers will probably start screaming. Which button do you think you select to actually put a map on this paper? It's not a trick question. Which one do you think it is? Which icon to you most looks like this should be a map to be put on? Is it this thing? No, that's a, a picture. Well, it's a, all the way down to for each the triangle with the point. Well, that's not even a note item. Oh, it looks like a map. That's a 3D map. There, there. there this one, and a map. It just, look, yeah, it's <laughs> it's all. And what you, but what you do is you lay it out, and you can see whatever size on the page it is. Here, I'm going to make it the full page. And there's your map. Now, you can do all kinds of wonderful things with this. You must add your scale bar so people know what scale your map is. You'll notice that the scale bar by default is this huge thing. I don't know why, but we'll just make it normal. And if you put it here, you can say, you know, this is in kilometers. You can put it in American if you want. Um, you can change the style of your text. You can do whatever you want with this. Like, you know, see all of your item properties, display, you can have a frame. You can have a background so you can read it, so on. You can put in a map B. This automatically grabs stuff. As you can see, like it grabs the elevations, it grabs those other icons that we used. You'll notice that it does not grab the size and color of our um, of our areas. It doesn't do that because for some reason, QGIS 
can't combine them as it is key yet. That is a shortcoming. They know about it. They haven't fixed it yet. Um, if I only was sizing it, it would be there. If I was only doing the color by the category, it would be there. It doesn't do both, which could be kind of aggravating, but, you know, it's free software. What are you going to do? And for that, you can go over here and just say what you want to include and what you don't want to include in your key. I'm just going to throw the key out there. And so you have a basic map here. And you can export this thing out. You can export it out as an image, as a PDF, print it. Or you, probably the best thing to do is export it out as an SVG file. Because from there, you have exported out all your stuff as vectors. And you can bring into something like Adobe Illustrator and actually each one of these vectors is a vector in Adobe Illustrator. So you can really fine tune how things look. You can bring in better text. You can actually make a map look really nice. And so you can do so you can do all that, but we'll just do a PNG for sake of argument for today. And I can say I'm gonna dump this in my desktop. That's gonna be called base.png because it be very it gets said how much resolution you have, so 600. And We'll then find it on my desktop. And here we are. Since it loads up, there's the map, the PNG file we can share with people, put in your book, whatever. So that's kind of the basic quick overview of gazetteers, how you make data, and can you just how you bring these in and actually start styling them. Um, so just on the print exports. So basically, I want to leave you with happy mapping. Um, that this that if you want more workshops on QGS, let us know. This is a very much a quick overview of how you get this stuff to work. But I can get into like, oh, let's look at actual querying. Let's look at spatial analysis more. If you want to get into different kinds of say vector editing or uh, like tracing rasters, we can do workshops on that. Um, or if you just want to talk about space, place, or mapping in general, feel free to contact me or. Contact OR, we go over this is what we do. Um, so I hope that with this, then you, you have kind of an overview of what QGIS is capable of. It doesn't scare you maybe quite as much getting into it as it might have been before. It's a very capable software pro platform. It does have some quirks, as you see. But overall, I found it to be a really, really useful GIS tool. So with that, um, yeah, <laughs> I see it here. It's not intuitive for most audience. It's not. QGIS does have those quirks. That's why, again, this is very much going through and saying, all right, here's how you get around some of those quirks. Here's how the basic use of it. And actually, once you get used to it, I found it to be extremely powerful. I do prefer it now to a lot of S3 products uh, because you do things like that edit. I can do have multiple layers editing at the same time. And you just click on whatever layer you, have to, you want to move. And that allows you to set up like Esri, where you have to stop, edit, start it on another layer, stop that edit, and start on another layer. You can actually just edit everything on the fly and give them a snap together. I, I, I found that for my workflow, it's a lot more useful. I guess that's the workshop. So <laughs> happy to have you.